G. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for making time. Are you, where are we catching you today? Uh, right now, I'm in a, I'm in a big church. Uh, the, I think east of uh, Quezon City, east of Man Metro Manila. I've been doing a big uh, altar mural here in one of the big churches here. Oh, fantastic. So I'm what staying, is staying here. Yeah. Staying here instead of uh, going back and forth from my studio, uh, I decided to just stay here until I finish the mural. And I've been working on it with my team for about uh, two, and a, two and a half weeks now. What is the mural exactly? So the church, uh, this is uh, the parish of uh, Our Lady of Fatima. So the church is about uh, the miracle in Fatima in 2017. It's like, a, uh, it's a big mural actually. I think it's the biggest in the Philippines in, inside the church. And it's a story uh, about the miracle, the apparition of uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary to the three kids in Fatima. Two of them are now uh, saints, Saint uh, Jacinta and Saint Francisco. And then, uh, the primary uh, visionary sister Lucia. Yeah. So that that's the that's the what the mural is about. Powerful work. <laughs> and that segues nicely. And thanks again for making time to chat. That segues nicely into kind of what you're doing now. Of course, um, what what uh, takes up most of your time now. But backing up a good bit. Obviously, you've had a long history of you know working for climate justice climate activism and what i'm curious what has been where did all that kind of come from where does your foundation i mean your brother yeb obviously has a long has a long history of this similar type of work and it's done a lot of great throughout the world done a lot of good throughout the world where does that foundation for you come from that that spiritual base mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been uh, a devotee for uh, Blessed Mother for a long time. Uh, but as far as uh, uh, climate issues are concerned, it was Sieb, my brother, who introduced me to this uh, big advocacy. Um, and then uh, I've been involved in um, relief missions for the past uh, several disasters in the Philippines. Um, like almost every year since uh, since 2009 uh, we have like really uh, terrible disasters relating to extreme weather events we have uh, at least or on the average 21 uh, weather disturbances every year and a few of those uh, weather disturbances are like super typhoons and they have become stronger and more violent in the past few years. So uh, that uh, involved me a lot in relief efforts, in psychosocial efforts. But then uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan in 2013 uh, was the, like, the big game changer, uh, not just for me, but for a lot of people here in the Philippines, a lot of environmental advocates. Uh, as far as the environmental uh, advocacy is concerned, uh, way before Typhoon Haiyan, I was already involved in uh, uh, in this uh, heavily uh, with my uh, work with uh, marine related um, advocacies and conservation efforts. Yeah, but uh, like I said, it was Seb who really got me into this advocacy since he's uh, uh, one of the chief negotiators of the Philippines in the UN Climate Summit. So. Uh, uh, I, th I think it's, he's been involved for maybe a, a decade and a half or even 20 years, I, I guess, uh, in this, uh, this movement already. Mm -hmm. And you said you've been devoted for a long time. Was that, did that come from then growing up in a Sanyo household? It was, you know, a key component of growing up or where did that kind of that spiritual base of faith come from for you? Yeah, the family, the household played a big role uh, in uh, um, in my foundations, in my spirituality, um, but also um, and also uh, being a student of a uh, Catholic school, uh, Catholic missionary school, um, uh, I got 
exposed to a lot of uh, different facets of uh, spirituality and also um, different, I, I, I learned about different missions within the church uh, because of my uh, education in Claret School. Uh, most of the the priests running the school are missionaries who have been uh, assigned to different parts of the world and um, uh, who have been exposed to different uh, uh, social classes, to different uh, social issues, different uh, mostly third world countries, including the Philippines. So early on, um, we have uh, been uh, exposed to stories about their missions in mountains in remote areas and that uh attracted or uh, i gravitated towards that towards uh, those kinds of stories um, well greatly because uh i love adventure and then uh i was able to to uh what they call this um i, I got really interested uh, with the concept of uh, being there for others yeah, so yeah, uh, I think that was uh, that played a big role, a big part in uh, uh, founding or uh, keeping my spirituality intact and uh, strong. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? That interest for being there for others, because surely you know other of your classmates have that same experience of that that church. But where did that kind of? Do you remember when you first kind of felt, hey, I need to, I need to kind of live this life. Yeah, well, um, I think it connects uh, greatly with the activism of uh, both my parents during the 70s and uh, 80, early 80s. Uh, they were both uh, freedom fighters uh, during the era of martial law in the Philippines. And uh, we spent a lot of time in uh, organizing for poor communities and even for students. And... Uh, me and my brothers, we met a lot of uh, advocates for social justice, social change. And because of that exposure, uh, we, we, we knew early on that uh, people need um, care, people need help, and, the, and people don't have the same level of, uh, uh, what do you call this, um, care given by the state or the government or the nation. And... Uh, there's so much injustice going on that the even wealth distribution is uh, very uh, uh, extreme. And it's uh, in the Philippines, uh, growing up, we knew the difference between uh, class. Like we have uh, areas that are uh, filled up with informal settlers, and we were exposed to these areas. We knew how. Uh, the poorest of the poor in the urban setting lives while we have uh, we also are exposed to the rich and famous of the Philippines of Manila so we knew that there's uh, something wrong there's a big disparity in uh, uh, wealth distribution and uh, services social services uh, and because of that I knew uh, personally that uh, something has to be done and people uh, a big a big population need more care than, than the rest. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned Typhoon Haiyan and how that had a large effect on you and a lot of other people, obviously in the Philippines. And in a story we have published on catholicclimatemovement.global, the Global Catholic Climate Movement website, you talk a lot about what that experience, the awful experience is like and the loss that it inflicted upon you, obviously your friend, your good friend, Agasistento. And, and can you kind of talk about, for people who maybe haven't read the story, and in just in general, what that, what and what effect that had on you of Typhoon Haiyang and why uh, you felt that way once that happened? Yeah, well, for, yeah first of all, for, for those uh, who doesn't know, who doesn't know about uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan, who have never heard about Super Typhoon Haiyan. It's uh, a very significant event when you uh, talk about climate uh, uh, justice or, or when you talk about the climate issues uh, in general, because it's the strongest uh, typhoon, basically strongest typhoon ever recorded in human history. It's, so it's uh, superlative. It's something 
out of the ordinary uh, something unprecedented and there were a lot of uh, victims uh, there were a lot of uh, families who lost loved ones uh, a lot of people got hurt and uh, in terms of uh, economy I, if i remember it right uh, two billion dollars lost in just a few hours um, a lot of uh, agriculture had been destroyed because of the, or was destroyed because of the typhoon and um, a lot of suffering uh, followed for several months after that. Um, I was there uh, before, during, and after, and to witness the strongest typhoon in human history uh, only means that we are, we the survivors are some of the few human beings who have, you know, experienced this uh, tremendous event. And uh, I would say that it was a game changer for for the movement uh, because um, it's so extreme that it had to be uh, talked about, uh, had to be tackled in the United Nations uh, summits for climate summits. Uh, because uh, although a single uh, weather weather event could not uh, produce uh, conclusions about uh, the direct connection of climate change to the event, um, a series of events for several years could somehow point to that direction of uh, not a conclusion but uh, uh, somehow um, a clear idea that these things are actually related to the warming climate to the warming uh, world that we have and uh, I think uh, well I'm also uh, like I said I was part of a conservation uh, of a conservation efforts for several years so uh, I'm, I'm exposed to science and I know that for a fact that we cannot make conclusions with a few, uh, just a few amount of data. Have to establish uh, data for a long period of time to be able to come up with conclusions. But uh, speaking about the climate crisis, I don't think we can wait for 20, 30 years to make conclusions because people are dying, people are suffering. And for someone who have lost uh, loved ones, we cannot wait, we have to speak now we have to project what's going to happen. We have to uh, make use of the available, available data, the available science, for us to make uh, uh, sound um, pronouncements. And I think uh, for most of us who survived and who were able to to, to go to the um, the global level of discussion, um, to be an activist in those levels of discussions, like in the United Nations summit or exposures engagements like this uh, I think we we need to we need to stress that this issue uh, has to be tackled now we can't wait anymore and um, we have to keep on saying that super typhoon Haiyan must not happen again that's the point that's the point of us fighting even though we already lost loved ones and we have been uh, being hurt, being traumatized is a thing of the past. But then it could happen, it could happen. And we know that uh, in the past few years, even in the past uh, two months, we have uh, witnessed unprecedented weather events. We have uh, cyclones be becoming more violent and becoming present in areas of the globe that had not been uh, visited by uh, or hit by cyclones before. Um, yeah, that's why, that's why, that's the reason why we keep on talking about Super Typhoon Haiyan. We cannot just uh, let that event pass without being talked about because that's the very thing, the exact thing that we don't want to happen again. That's the exact thing that we're trying to prevent by pushing for reforms, by pushing for a fossil fuel uh, free world. Mm -hmm. And just to just to go back, very well said, but just to go back to the point about the science. Obviously, the science is clear that storms get 
their energy from more water vapor from the water vapor in the oceans and then the warm of the oceans the more water vapor for these storms so like you said like while it's hard to say you know pinpoint one specific storm the science backs the, the likelihood that it, of climate change affecting these powerful storms yeah that's true that's right the you obviously lost your friend agate his wife and then their son Taryn at the time what you know and other people might you know they might have that experience and then they kind of move on right they look to put it past them but you have done the opposite you have talked about it like you are now you have you know tried like you said tried to make sure that typhoon super two typhoon Haiyan never happens again why has that you know, why do you feel so compelled to to do this work still, even after you know experiencing the some of the worst effects of the climate change so far, and being there, like you said, in Taklaban during the storm? I think being a, a part of the climate movement, even before uh, experiencing Super Typhoon Haiyan, uh, makes me feel responsible um, and makes me feel uh, in well makes me invested in this uh this issue and this uh um advocacy um i think i have a responsibility to to talk about what i know and to communicate uh what i know to those people who know less um yeah that plays a, a, a that that was one of my driving forces in in my life and why i'm doing this because i feel responsible and like, let's say a common, uh, uh, a regular uh, fisher folk uh, in Tacloban City, who never had the chance to learn about um, the climate, uh, the science about the climate, about the changing climate, and then he gets hit by this terrible storm, loses his livelihood, his home, his family, and then recovers. Uh, uh, he starts his life. He has uh, an obligation for maybe for some other relatives, for himself to survive and to go back to being a fisherman. But for me, no, I, I, I was involved in this even before. And I know that uh, this issue is something to be fought for by somebody. And knowing what I know, I don't think uh, it is moral for me. Uh, morally correct for me to just shy away from it and just leave the issue behind. I mean, yes, some some people will probably step up later on. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, Agit's sister, like really young, uh, young a young girl, uh, she was 21 or 22 during that time when Typhoon Haiyan killed her family. Uh, she stepped up, uh, came out of her shell and became a strong voice for people from Tacloban and uh, she was able to uh, reach a lot of uh, great heights in uh, getting uh, uh, a chance to speak in different platforms uh, but not a lot of people are like her not a lot of people uh, get the chance to to find out about what happened um, I don't think we, we had a good amount of information and education after the event, after Super Typhoon Haiyan. So people went back to their lives, but were never really educated about what happened. But for those who know, I think it's a big responsibility to keep on talking about this and to inform our fellow Filipinos that uh, something's happening and we need to do something about it. And we need to speak up. And we need to be heard by people who have the capacity to make change, uh, for example, uh, policymakers. Uh, if they would not hear from survivors about what we need, what, what we want to happen, I don't think they will really uh, spend time in working for uh, for climate uh, justice. You know, there are not not a lot of uh, legislators in the Philippines even know what climate justice is about. So we. I find that we have the responsibility to talk about this and to keep on pushing for for a change regarding this issue. 
Mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that you feel responsible as well when, I mean, obviously the Philippines and other countries in the Asia Pacific Oceania will bear the, have bared or have a, experienced the worst effects of climate change and will in the future yet have very little to do with the greenhouse gas emissions that scientists say are causing this, yet you feel that responsibility. Yeah, I feel that responsibility because I have uh, in my hands uh, knowledge and information and I cannot just uh, throw it away. Uh, we are being impacted by this. Uh, if you will not, if you will wait for the bigger countries or the corporations to act, I don't think uh, there will be change. I, I don't think that things will uh, get better because uh, I don't know if it's right, it's, it's okay to say this, but uh, over the course of the past one or two decades, we have uh, unearthed or people have unearthed uh, motives from the corporations, uh, even political figures about denying or spending uh, money and effort and fortune in, uh, uh, in climate denial. Okay, so the, the bigger countries who are responsible for this, not a lot of them are willing to, you know, to, to take responsibility. So waiting for them to do that uh, might turn futile while us being impacted, us who, who, have, who has the knowledge or the information uh, we need to step up to. We need to make noise and we need to tell them what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, message for everyone. We need to step up. We need to tell them what they need to hear. What are you, you're painting the mural with your team now, but what occupies a lot of your time in regards to climate activism and, and seeking climate, working for climate justice? in the Philippines and throughout the world? Okay, uh, well, climate communication is uh, probably on top of the list. Uh, I use my art uh, and creativity to spread the message. Uh, I also spend a lot of time uh, talking about this in public uh, in different uh, parts of the world. Uh, well, uh, of course, in the past uh, seven or eight months during the pandemic, uh, no chance to travel. Uh, also, I, I tried to limit my travel because it uh, creates a big uh, carbon footprint for me as an individual. And now we have discovered that Zooming and uh, conferencing to the web is a very powerful tool as well. So I find myself very, very busy. I think since uh, the lockdown in mid-March of this year, probably had uh, at least um, one one Zoom uh, meeting or conference every week. Yeah, that's on the average. So yeah, I had had I spent a lot of time talking about this, uh, about the climate, about even uh, other issues of the environment, plastic pollution, and everything else that connects to the climate. And uh, most of my audience are the youth from different organizations uh, from different parts of the world. And then as uh, regarding my art, I still continue uh, creating murals about the environment. And I think I have done, I have been probably more, probably busier during the pandemic painting murals uh, compared to before the pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also the Black Pencil Project. Can you explain to people who haven't heard anything about that, why what it is and why it's important, especially now in this era of, as we see the effects of climate change throughout the world. Yeah, Black Pencil Project was founded by uh, photographers, some of my very good friends who have been uh, traveling around the Philippines, taking photographs, taking uh, travel pictures and everything else. Um, they decided to use that platform of uh, local tourism to bring um, school supplies to uh, marginalized sectors of uh, the remote areas, uh, the, the far-flung provinces. And we um, started doing this, um, I think, in 2008, 2009. Um, and then it evolved into a, like a psychosocial farm during disasters. Uh, 
like for example, uh, there's a province that uh, was devastated by a typhoon in Mindanao, and then what we found out is that even the schools were like buried in mud and rocks, and the students lost everything. So aside from relief uh, uh, relief goods, we all decided to bring school supplies and art supplies. And then we started teaching art and uh, doing art sessions in evacuation centers uh, to relieve uh, the youth, especially of the trauma. And we also gathered like thousands and thousands of uh, soft toys from all over the world so we can distribute them along with the school supplies, along with the art supplies. Um, and this became regular. And um, our my, my, my fellow Black Pencil Project uh, core members uh, continued on uh, in different individual capacities. Uh, even during the time of the pandemic, some of us uh, are busier than the others. So the others, uh, uh, other members of the group uh, conducted fundraisers for PPEs, for relief goods, for several other uh, items that would be uh, deemed as necessities from different provinces. So we can we continue to activate the group uh, in times of need. And uh, I'd say that on top of the list would be disaster areas. So far this year, uh, we haven't had uh, a major like a like a really big uh, weather disturbance. We had a few uh, strong typhoons early on. But I think uh, we haven't seen the worst yet, and we're always on standby. And I think this is a big part of uh, a, big, a good example of uh, trying to be um, adapted to the times. Uh, it's one of the one of uh, a good form of adaptation measure is to be uh, ready to help the community and to to be ready to um, share or to redirect, let's say, um, uh, we, we, we get uh, donations from, uh, from sectors of the middle class, people who have uh, uh, more privilege than the others. And then the most, uh, we know that most of the, I mean, uh, the lower uh, classes of society find it harder to adapt and find it harder to uh, to face um, weather disturbances and even uh, other effects uh, or impacts of climate change. So we make it a point to prioritize them when we distribute the goods. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about too how, how that type of work almost has to go hand in hand with other relief efforts now, right? Art as a form of a form of therapy as well. Why is that the case? So why have you all seen that being the case and being so impactful for these youth? Yeah, well, first and foremost, um, art is my uh, main line, and that's what I'm good at. So that's what I make use of. That's what I utilize. And uh, in the recent uh, years, uh, art therapy has become a, a big, a big thing for mental wellness. And I have been uh, involved in doing this art therapy for a while and I've presented papers about it. So I, I, I would say that it's something that I'm good at. So I make use of it. And one message that I always tell my audience is that whatever you do in life, whatever uh, skill you have or capacity you have or special specialization that you have, make use of it to help people uh, in times of need. And whoever you are in society, whether you're a student, an engineer, an artist, a musician, a teacher, you can be part of the solution process of the climate crisis. And that's why uh, I keep on saying, I keep on uh, talking about my art as a tool so that I can inspire others to uh, make what they have as a tool also to, to help people or to be there for others. That's a great place to, I think, a good place to end it, AG. Thank you so much for your time.
appreciate you sharing your story once more. And for people who are interested, well, we have a story on uh, Global Catholic Climate Movement website, catholicclimatemovement.global about AG and his story and the story of surviving Typhoon Haiyan and your work now. So thank you again so much for making time and sharing your story. Thank you very much, John. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to share my story with you because I know that it uh, will reach more people around the world. And I'm looking forward to working more with uh, the global Catholic climate movement. We have a lot of things to, to work on and we will keep on working for them. Definitely, definitely. We appreciate it and thank you again. So best of luck with the mural and we will talk soon. Take care, AG. Take care. Thank you very much. Yep. Ciao. Bye-bye.